pedagogical training is on the rise. How are these immersive tools helping learners to gain knowledge and skills better? With improved XR, aspiring doctors can practice new techniques without risking patients' lives. A risk-free environment with real-time feedback helps doctors become more precise. Even established surgeons can become better using XR. When planning and training for complicated surgeries, XR helps visualize the procedure. Being able to interact with models increases accuracy and the chances of favorable outcomes once the process is carried out. XR provides an opportunity for professional surgeons to help designing content and connecting with thousands of residents worldwide to tackle the soon coming demand and supply gap in surgeons also helping them to balance between their duties towards patients and trainees. Professor Sean Tierney, the Dean of Professional Practice at the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland, was the developer of the world's first fully interactive VR-based medical training simulator. With over 120,000 users around the world giving a positive response for this program, we are delighted to have this opportunity to host Professor Tierney at XR2020. Welcome, Professor. Uh, thanks very much, Sana. Thanks for the invitation, and I'm delighted to join you uh, online for this uh, virtual conference on uh, the use of all different types of reality in terms of training. M maybe it'd be useful for your audience if I start with a little bit of context and background. Um, and uh, not many of you may have been to Ireland and indeed there's not likely to be anyone coming to Ireland in the near future. Um, but uh, we won one national training program across the whole country. So the Republic of Ireland is that lower left uh, section of the map. Uh, about 5 million people, about 30 acute hospitals and we have 10 specialty training programs with 300 trainees and over 400 trainers across a variety of elective and uh, emergency hospitals. Those hospitals are grouped into six groups and our postgraduate surgical training program, so that's residency program, is broken into two phases, two years of early training and six years of higher training. Um, our simulation training and our laboratory skills training is based almost entirely at this building you see on the left hand side of the screen, which is our new simulation centre which opened uh, uh, just two years ago. Uh, which costs 50 million euros and has simulation training for both surgical trainees and medical students uh, across seven floors. So I thought it might be useful to bring you on a journey about how we've used simulation within our training program uh, going back over the past 20 years and maybe finish up with some thoughts on how we think it might develop over the next uh, uh, 10 years. Um, one of the early studies we did over 10 years ago was to look at how we might use simulation to guide us in fine-tuning other aspects of our training program. And this work by Christina Buckley looked at assessing trainees' aptitude and looking how they performed in the acquisition of technical skills um, or how they differed in their acquisition of technical skills based on their baseline aptitudes. And we used, to determine aptitude, we used some standard visuospatial tests which are administered using a, a, a computer package and some paper-based tests. And we looked at some students and broke them into two categories based on their performance in those tests, uh, those with high innate ability and those with lower innate ability, based on visual spatial test scores only. And what we showed was when we put them through a laparoscopic skills training program, uh, that those with high aptitude uh, performed better, uh, learned the skills more quickly, and outperformed those with lower aptitude in almost all aspects of the training program. And while that might seem obvious, it did suggest to us, and I suppose has subsequently been shown, that those with high innate ability acquire skills more quickly and move more quickly along the learning curve. It doesn't mean that those with low aptitudes, or at least lower aptitudes, can't acquire those skills, but they have to put a little bit more effort into it. It takes a bigger investment, perhaps more time in the simulation lab, before they reach the uh, level on the performance curve where they're ready to move into real patient experience. So we think there is a difference uh, between uh, the performance 
or at least the speed at which those with high and low aptitudes move along our training pathway. And we now use that as part of our selection uh, using a novel um, uh, aptitude training tool that we've developed ourselves. Uh, we assign a weighting of 15% for uh, visuospatial aptitudes in our selection process in the entry uh, into surgical training. Uh, this is data from last year and we've used this again this year. When trainees come into our program, we do a full immersive simulation week to take them up to speed before we actually bring them into the clinical environment at all. So they spend a full week in the simulation lab and we published our findings uh, just a few years ago in the American Journal of Surgery. Leone Heskin wrote that up. So it's a mandatory program, it's five days, it's full time, and it's before their clinical rotations commence. And it's focused on technical skills, but also very much on non-technical skills. And we do believe that a lot of those skills can similarly de be developed in a classroom environment, in a virtual environment, where it's much safer for patients uh, than it is acquiring these skills on a, a learn them as you go uh, in, in the real, work, real clinical environment. And what we've shown is that those who come in and do this immersive experience substantially improve their clinical skills over the week. And in fact, if you look at versus the group on the left-hand side there, they perform better than those who went through a conventional training program before our boot camp was in place. It's been a challenge this year delivering the boot camp uh, given the restrictions of COVID-19 and it's been delivered by a combination of online and some on-site skills-based training. Um, and I think we're going to uh, look at evolving uh, this further in the future to see how much of this could be de delivered uh, at home or in the workplace to trainees, but away from the clinical environment. And we've shown that in simulated procedures, those who've gotten through this boot camp actually perform better. So these procedures are performed in a simulated uh, wound or a simulated lipoma uh, or abdominal wound closure and the trainees perform better than those trainees which haven't been through a boot camp. And the trainees are more confident and I think we're reassured that we're increasing their confidence but also uh, doing that while increasing their abilities. Perhaps the worst outcome of all training programs is people who are more confident, but not necessarily more able. Uh, and I think the boot camp probably does both. It makes people more confident, uh, less fearful of entering uh, the clinical environment. Uh, and in fact, uh, th that uh, confidence is well founded. So over the year, uh, uh, our trainees spend a lot of time in uh, the simulated environment. They do uh, five days of operative skills in our skills lab, three days of human factors training, and they undergo a formal assessment, which is used uh, as part of our um, uh, progression uh, uh, metrics for trainees moving on to the next phase of the training program. So simulation is all very well. Showing that people can perform better on a simulated patient is a good measure of the outcome of a simulation training. But of course, the real test is when things go wrong. And uh, uh, half the world probably thinks that Tom Hanks landed this Airbus in the Hudson um, uh, uh, some years ago. Of course, it was Chesney Sullenberger who famously said he spent his whole life training for this one single event where he landed in the river and all patients and crew safely escaped to the shore. We have some really good data going back uh, nearly 20 years now from uh, Tony Gallagher's group to show that residents who train to proficiency in a virtual reality environment, now this was a, a, a box simulator rather than a full VR uh, simulator, uh, uh, perform better when they perform a laparoscopic cholecystectomy than in a real patient. So having been trained to proficiency, uh, they perform better in the real world than trainees who just go through the usual observe and then operate under supervision. And we've similarly shown in superficial femoral artery angioplasty using a combination of didactic training for one group of residents and didactic training plus simulation training to proficiency and then observing them performing their first real patient uh, uh, by a blinded expert, we've shown that trainees perform better when they've been through a virtual reality to, pro to proficiency training program. So basic endovascular skills in the simulation do translate to real world performance. And not only have we shown that in the endovascular environment, we've shown it in the open surgery environment in one of the few uh, uh, studies on um, uh, open surgery using a, a limbs and things model to train to proficiency and then performing those procedures in real patients, we've shown the trainees who are trained in that environment perform better in the real world. So simulation 
aids deliberate practice, it can speed the learning curve, it gives us a reproducible tool for assessment, and we believe it can accelerate people along the performance curve uh, to, to perform better in real patients, although we don't yet have good hard evidence on actual patient outcomes, uh, so less complications, lower mortality, uh, shorter hospital stay, and so on. So when virtual reality um, uh, moved to the full virtual reality environment, we looked at the uh, Samsung Gear uh, Oculus training uh, uh, tool to see what could we do to assess um, and move people along a skills training environment using this technology. And Sana mentioned our medical training sim, which was deployed in the Oculus uh, shop uh, in uh, 2017. Um, so far, there's been 120 downloads. There's been very positive feedback uh, from it, from all the users. Um, and uh, we're still exploring where the next uh, phase of this might be. So this is a simulated trauma patient brought into a trauma bay and taken through their initial assessment and then their subsequent um, uh, systematic treatment of complications. So we've assessed this uh, at an ATLS course looking at the uh, feedback from the faculty and from the, tr the trainees uh, on that course and we published this in the American Journal of Surgery uh, in 2018. And most of the feedback was positive and probably the greatest problem is uh, this lag that was present in that device which caused a certain amount of nausea uh, uh, for uh, the users and I think uh, a certain limitation people saw on access to VR simulators at the time, some of which I think is still true today, although the lag issue has been addressed. Uh, by better design of simulation and by better uh, technology. So we have no patient outcomes, but we did look at the outcome for virtual patients. In our simulated environment, bad decisions result in patient, virtual patient death. And our experienced instructors uh, performed better than our uh, novice candidates in terms of virtual patient deaths, in terms of uh, uh, decisions made. Uh, and in terms of correct diagnosis, uh, they were roughly similar. So we certainly see evidence uh, for construct validity of our model in terms of experts versus novices. We've also looked at 360 degree videos uh, and the usefulness of this for trainees in terms of immersive uh, exposure in a passive way to observing operations. Uh, and uh, we had a lot of positive feedback from our trainees uh, who felt that it was more engagement, engaging and provided better uh, attention focus uh, than standard videos um, on a 2D, in a 2D environment. Um, and there's been subsequent studies, I think, confirming that 360 immersive videos uh, probably uh, are a way forward. And we use this technology now with our medical student applicants on our open days to give them a better feeling for what it's like uh, uh, in, in the surgical environment. It's not possible for us to bring uh, high school students into an operating room to show what an operation is like, but we can give them a virtual reality uh, uh, close encounter at least uh, with the uh, surgical experience. And uh, certainly again our feedback on that uh, has been extremely positive. I think there are challenges in how we use virtual reality uh, and whether that's any form of it, uh, I think a lot of the analysis of it has been relatively non-critical and I think we need to continue to assess the performance of people who are trained in these methods in the real world. Uh, both to convince those who fund education uh, and also to convince users themselves uh, of the value of these techniques. But I think most of us can see that uh, 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 practicing in these environments and the more real the environment the better um, uh, is a logical and a safe way uh, for people to acquire skills before they move into the clinical environment. And I think this is true worldwide. Uh, in the early phases of our uh, simulation training, we developed a mobile skills lab. But when we built the new skills lab in, in uh, Dublin, uh, we no longer needed a mobile skills lab. And in a collaboration with the College of Surgeons of East Central and Southern Africa, we shipped our skills lab uh, to um, uh, Tanzania uh, and it now has moved to various locations in East Africa where it's used for training of surgeons in this region uh, on the basic uh, uh, surgical techniques, laparoscopic techniques and open techniques uh, in a region where there are very few uh, uh, surgical trainees and where the need for uh, uh, access to surgery is absolutely enormous. 
This is the 10 countries in East and Southern Africa, which are among the poorest uh, uh, 10 countries in the world. And I think there's a great opportunity for those in low resource environments to leapfrog uh, a lot of the learning curve that we have uh, 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 experienced over the past uh, 20 years to move surgical training forward. So I think in future, we're going to continue uh, to use simulation I think we need to continue to validate and demonstrate its cost effectiveness because investment in these things is, is significant. There's a significant cost attached to it. And I think we need to show some of the savings in terms of the time uh, to proficiency, in terms of patient outcomes, and in terms of indeed savings uh, in the delivery of health services. I think there needs to be, we need to be careful about ensuring that the developments are clinically led uh, because lots of things are technologically possible but aren't always as clinically relevant. And I think the involvement of clinicians in developing the next uh, generation uh, of virtual reality tools is really important. They need, those tools need to be embedded in a curriculum that moves uh, surgical trainees and indeed experienced surgeons uh, along a learning pathway that has meaningful measures in terms of their uh, professional development. I think these things need to be accessible and reliable uh, particularly if they're going to be effective in low resource environments. Uh, we've got to deal with things like the nausea, the lag, uh, the challenge of moving headsets from one person to another in a, a COVID pandemic is, is not least, uh, is not least uh, the challenges. And of course, they have to be affordable. Um, so I'm sorry I can't join you in reality. This is where I am today. This is Greystones on the east coast of Ireland. It's not always quite as sunny as this, but on a nice day, it's certainly a very pleasant place for a walk. So thanks very much, Sana, and I'm happy to take any questions you or colleagues might have. Thank you so much, Professor. How do you see the future of XR and distance learning? We've been using remote learning in surgery for over 20 years and uh, as an example again uh, that has been really useful in low resource environments in East Africa where travel is very expensive and the time taken away from the clinical environment is very expensive. So the use of e-learning uh, has been uh, particularly useful. Um, I think there's two aspects to it. I mean uh, obviously currently uh, even time on site in our campus at RCSI is difficult and uh, uh, additional spacing and um, care for movement of people restricts our use of the facility somewhat, but nothing like the extent that there's restrictions in our hospitals. So uh, increasingly we're getting our students and indeed our surgical trainees to spend more time in the simulation lab, spacing those things out appropriately, uh, maybe avoiding some of the classroom work. So we do the classroom didactic part online. So he here's what you're going to experience here's what you're supposed to learn, here's some of the information you might need, and then you come in and you spend a shorter time focused in the skills lab working with the technology. And we can rotate people in shifts in that way. Indeed, just last year we've set up a new course where some residents are spending a year full time in the simulated environment in our skills lab before they move into the clinical environment. And the goal is that when you move in, you'll move more quickly through, uh, uh, be more useful in terms of clinical service delivery, and we'll reduce unnecessary exposure to uh, um, uh, infections and um, uh, have, uh, allow for better infection control procedures. So I think simulation will certainly lend itself to solving some of the challenges that we're seeing in the COVID-19 era. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, immersive technologies help us reach learners in remote areas and train them for life-saving procedures. Please share your thoughts about this. I think that's important. I think one of the benefits, so we saw this with some of our work with videos, and we have a, an online app for surgical trainees called msurgery.ie. It's a, it's a website-driven app. Uh, and one of the focuses we have uh, uh, put there is just-in-time training. So a lot of the things people need to do, they do every day. You can train them up to a high level of proficiency and then they practice them every day and they don't need an awful lot of ongoing training. But then there are things that they do relatively infrequently. And we can prepare them for that, but it's two, three, four years ago. And yet today they're going to have to do that procedure. So providing them with some video, some virtual reality environment is a really useful way to do that. And of course now, we, I think as, as you're suggesting, 
there's an environment where people may have to do things that they've never done before for the first time because the, 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 the patient demands are such, uh, uh, patients are so ill, uh, or they're moving into uh, ICU or other areas where they don't normally work. And I think we can provide them with a more, um, a richer uh, a preparatory experience on a just-in-time basis just before they move in. So how do I put a, a central line into a patient how do I intubate a patient? How do I ventilate a patient? There's no one else to do it. Then the better the quality of the preparation I can have, the more likely it's going, uh, the, the, the patient is going to have a successful outcome. So it's not desirable that people end up in those situations, but just-in-time training can be a really useful refresher where you have had some background training, uh, but now you can't go back to the, the classroom. You need to do this for, uh, for real uh, in the next few minutes. And I think that's probably going to become much more important over the next few years. It's very nice to meet you again, and I wish you a successful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor. It was a pleasure to have you with us.